This is Lewis Lapham for Lapham's Quarterly, and this is the World in Time. Lead support for this podcast has been provided by Elizabeth Lizette Prince. Additional support was provided by James J. Jimmy Coleman, Jr. Speaking today with the historian and journalist Catherine Nixie about her new book, The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the Classical World. You tell a story, Catherine, at odds with the conventional narrative about the Roman Empire's conversion to Christianity in the 4th and 5th centuries A.D., Perhaps you can begin by reminding us of the familiar oft-told tale. Yeah, of course. Uh, It's a tale I'm very familiar with because I was brought up by a former monk and a former nun, so my childhood was steeped in this story. And it's the narrative we've seen in a hundred Hollywood films. It's the one we sing in hymns in church. And it's the story of wicked, oppressing Romans crushing the Christians of the empire who just want to be free and want to praise God and want to show each other love and that the evil Romans are stopping them doing it. And in fact, actually, when you look at almost any element of that story, it's a nonsense. So take one part of it, the idea that the Romans were crushing other people's religion. They just simply weren't. On the whole, they left Christians in peace. I mean, there's a very obvious fact that shows us that the Romans were not the rotten oppressors of narrative, and that's that in the world today there are two billion Christians and there are no Roman pagans left. Now, that gives you an idea of who was fighting really hard in this battle and who won. The Christians won. And so What were the Romans like? Well, they just weren't that interested in persecuting Christians. These tales we have of martyrs being pursued by beastly Roman governors, you know, they're always in Hollywood, they're often played by Peter Ustinov, they're often fat and they're, you know, hounding these Christians to death. And it's rubbish. So more often than not, the Romans just left the Christians in peace. When Christians did appear before them, the Roman governors would often try and let the Christians off. They didn't want to execute them, partly because they couldn't be bothered, partly they had better things to do, and partly because they realized full well that they didn't want martyrs on their hands. But more, they just weren't that bothered, right? So the Christians will turn up before them and say, kill me, because the Christians, this is the thing we don't understand today. They really, really wanted to die. Because it was said that if you were a martyr, if you died a martyr's death, you would get a hundred times the rewards in heaven. You'd get a hundred times the oxen, a hundred times the family, a hundred times the children. And so there were Christians who not only had a suicidal desire for martyrdom, but who actually committed suicide to get these martyrs' rewards in heaven. And of course, fame on earth, because being a martyr was, you know, a short route to fame. George Bernard Shaw once said that becoming a martyr is the only way that you can become famous without talent or ability. And I think it was true, <laughs> as true then as it is now. <laughs> All right. Remind, re, remind us along these lines of the Roman uh, historian Pliny as a governor in Bithynia in 111 AD, who his attitude is the attitude of the civilized Roman world. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So you sort of see the best, uh, best and the worst of, because Pliny is not to- whiter than white. It has to be said he tortures a couple of Christians and does kill a couple of them. <laughs> However, he only, they only come to his attention because the Christians are annoying their neighbors. The polytheist Romans found the Christians deeply irritating, partly because they were very smug and superior. They kept saying, your gods are nonsense, our gods the only true god. And all the other Romans were like, well, why? Why do you think you're so special? Um, And also they did things like they wouldn't go to the baths and they wouldn't take their clothes off in front of each other in the baths. They wouldn't take part in festivals. They were very reclusive, very superior. They never mixed. They uh, were pious. And... So then they start irritating their neighbours and people start writing letters to Pliny because he's a governor in a place called Bithynia Pontus, which is what you need to know about it is it's basically the back of beyond. It's, it's what is today uh, northern northern Turkey, what was then Asia Minor. So people write to him and they say, look, these Christians are really annoying. Will you do something about them? So he looks into what they're doing. And this is the first record we have of a Roman governor meeting with Christians and it's nothing like the story so Pliny is he's a bit 
baffled. What are these Christians doing? So he asks them what they're doing. And they say, well, we like to eat together and sing hymns. And he says, okay, fine. Uh, but you have to sacrifice to the emperor. So they, so some of them do and some of them don't. Now, sacrificing to the emperor is not in Roman eyes. This is what annoyed the Romans about the Christians. It was that they didn't take part in the things in the empire. It wasn't that they wanted the Christians to become not Christian. They just wanted them to worship, to not to worship. They wanted them to show respect to the empire itself. So it was like standing for the national anthem or taking your hat off. Uh, as a mark of respect when the president came into the room, something like that. Um, And so Pliny then writes to the emperor and he says, I don't know what to do with these Christians. People are angry about them. They don't bother me. What should I do? And the emperor says, and this is so different from the films, the emperor says, these people must not be hounded out and you must not take anonymous declarations against them. He said it's quite against the spirit of our age. So what you get is in this first encounter, recorded encounter between the Romans and the Christians, you get the Roman Empire saying, Emperor saying, leave them alone. We, ha- we must not hound these people out. That is not what we do. Now, if you fast forward 150 years and you come to when the Christians gain power almost instantly, that the world changes and the Christians, by contrast, pursue a policy of hounding out every last pagan eventually until there are no more left. And that's why, you know, we have the situation where we have two billion Christians and no what we would call pagan. All right. Move forward from 111 AD, Pliny and Trajan, to St. Anthony in 270. And what what has happened uh, by that time? I mean, the, the manners and mores of the Roman Empire, their attitude toward pleasure, their attitude toward baths, mm-hmm. their mm-hmm. attitude toward sexual congress between mm-hmm. men and women is is uh, very liberal but how how do we get how do we get saint anthony talk about him <laughs> for a while because because this is this is the beginning of of the of the uh you know the war ag- against evil mm. so it's really amazing in the middle of this empire that is really far more liberal than anything that you'll see again for for hundreds, possibly, you know, well over a millennium. You know, the Romans, they have their gods and they worship their gods, but their gods aren't that interested in what they do in their private lives. And in their private lives, the Romans have limits, but they have fun. So there's a famous Roman gravestone, and it says, uh, bathing in Venus, and by Venus they mean lovemaking, uh, wear you out, but they are the stuff of life. Um And they have this general idea that life should be enjoyed. So a really common motif you see on Roman houses, on their mosaics and on their drinking cups, is a picture of a skeleton drinking. And underneath will say something like, have fun, enjoy your life. And these appear all over the Roman Empire. And the idea is, well, it's Horace's famous carpe diem. Life is short. Make the most of it while you can. And that is, if you were to sum up, the general idea of the Roman Empire, that's not a bad idea to choose. You know, there were people who were more Puritan, but generally that was the thought, you know, you're not here for long, have fun. And then come the Christians, and their idea is radically different. Because their idea... Their idea is, the ancient idea is that the meaning of life is the pursuit of beauty and pleasure, and that Christians change pleasure to sin and the meaning of life to pain. Exactly. And they say, firstly, God is watching you. Secondly, he doesn't want you to have fun. And thirdly, pleasure in all its forms is a sin. So in the ancient world, you know, typical ancient spends his time bathing, hunting, swimming, making love, you know, having fun with his, his friends. And then St. Anthony is the perfect Christian because what he does is he goes to live in the desert and eats nothing but a dry piece of bread sort of every 30 days or something. And he lives in a cave and he becomes incredibly thin. And he, what he says he's doing is fighting with demons. So what you start to see is that the Christians start to call anything that they don't agree with becomes a demon. So if you disagree with me, you're a demon. If you're not Christian, you're a demon. And St. Anthony spends all his life in the desert fighting with different kind of demons, imaginary demons. So he doesn't have any uh, friends around him. He doesn't have any food. And crucially, 
he doesn't have any books. So St. Anthony becomes celebrated because he knows nothing. This is the glorious thing that people talk about Anthony. And he inspires St. Augustine because he doesn't read any books and he just sits in the desert starving himself. And he becomes the perfect Christian. So the perfect Roman had been this kind of what we would think of as a Renaissance man, someone who is at once, you know, healthy in mind and body, that's the phrase, anima sans in corpore sano, who is fit, who is healthy, who is beautiful, and who learns a lot, who reads a lot, who speaks several languages, who is conversant with the Greek tragedies, with the Roman philosophers. And then the Christians start to worship this man who lives in a hole in a desert. And he reads no books. And they start to say things like, wisdom is foolishness. So this is what you get in St. Paul, right? This wisdom is foolishness because you don't need books. They just puff you up. You don't need, you don't need philosophy. It just contradicts Christianity. All you need is yourself and your God. And that is the way to salvation. And that attitude begins to become, to appeal to large numbers of people toward the end of the third century. And St. Anthony is a personification, an exemplar, celebrity of that attitude. So paradoxically, this guy who says, don't read, you know, this, this man uh, who is celebrated for not reading books becomes something of a kind of bestseller in the ancient world and people read his life. And you have stories of people giving up their book collections when they become Christian. They say, I don't need, don't need these books anymore. I have God. And so there is a this is a criticism that the pagans raise again and again against the Christians is that they're stupid. So the Christ, non-Christians, when they look at Christianity, firstly, they can't understand how you could celebrate a book such as the Bible that's written so badly because the Bible is supposed to be the word of God. And if this is the word of God, God is terrible at grammar and doesn't seem to be able to understand how to speak properly. And he doesn't even know the right words for things. So he's saying the equivalent of, of serviette for napkin and settee for sofa. And he's making all these mistakes. So the non-Christians are like, this, this man is a fool. And he's, you know, and these, these one philosopher describes the Old Testament as utter trash. He says, it's utter trash. You wouldn't tell stories like this to a child. And another one says, I don't, you know, Jonah and the whale. What is that nonsense? There's no way a man could survive in the belly of a fish. And there's a real horror among pagan intellectuals and also among Christian intellectuals at the stupidity, what they see as the stupidity of Christian teaching. But in the new Christian world, that doesn't matter because the new Christian world says, well, pagan philosophy is evil and it all disagrees with itself. And crucially, it tells you that God doesn't matter. So there's lots of pagan philosophies that say things like, we're all made of atoms. You don't have to worry about God. Or there is no creator God. You don't have to pray to anyone. You don't have to be afraid. Be free. You know, the world is a free and beautiful place. You're just atoms and stuff. And when you die, you die. And the Christians really attack, particularly the philosophy that said that. And they attack all the other philosophies that disagree with Christianity as well. And, and, that, and that attack becomes increasingly severe after the uh, entrenchment of Constantine as the first Christian Roman emperor in 315 AD. Exactly. So the date that really, really matters in the conversion of Europe is that Constantine sees this flaming cross in the sky and then he is convinced that God is protecting him and he starts to favor the Christian God over all the other gods. And from then on, that moment on, everything starts to turn. And this very varied and vigorous empire starts to become increasingly mono, increasingly singular, increasingly monotheistic, but also increasingly singular in all the behaviors that it considers acceptable. So uh, what you get is that pretty soon Constantine starts saying that other, other religions are less good. And then soon people start saying that they're not just less good, they're insane and they're demonic. And they, people start to get demonized in the laws in this very vicious way. So they start to be described as sick and an illness. And the illness is the crucial one, because once you're in illness, then you need to be cured. And what cures you? Well, you have to have your mind changed. And what changes your mind? And this is where St. Augustine steps in and he starts to imply that to physically force someone to give up their old religion is not a cruelty, but a kindness. So he says, a loving father beats his son, but, you know, he doesn't do it because he's cruel. He does it because he cares. 
so Augustine opens the door to a thousand years of persecution by his argument that to help people be cured of their illness, be cured of their wrong beliefs, whatever those wrong beliefs are, then you should use physical force. And increasingly, this is what the laws do. They start to rule that if you're going into an ancient temple, then you can be struck down by a sword. If you're uh, if you're sacrificing to the old gods, then eventually you'll be able to be executed. And this whole severe, relentless persecution of anyone who deviates from the Christian teaching starts to begin. And this is just, just the interesting thing about this is when you read about Christianity in the stories in the history books that most of us will have read. They describe the moment of Constantine's conversion as the end of persecution. You'll often see it even now in history books. The chapter will be titled something along the lines of the end of persecution. But it's rubbish. It's nothing of the kind. It's the end of Christians being persecuted in the set in a sense, but the Romans almost never persecuted any. And they often tried to let them off when they came in front of them. So you hear accounts of Roman governors saying things like but it's such a sunny day. Are you sure you want to become a martyr? Or why don't you just touch the sacrifice? You don't have to make a sacrifice. Just touch it and I'll let you go. Or, you know, think of your mum. She'll be so sad. You have this account of the governor saying, but, you know, your mother will be so sad if you die now. Don't die. You know, live your life. Enjoy the world. It's a sunny day. Have fun. So the punishment and the cruelty increases steadily across the 4th and 5th centuries. And yes. that, with that also comes uh, burning of books across the whole of the empire. I mean, it's like uh, Nazi Germany. Yeah, well, there are these burn, bonfires of books. Um, and what's interesting is, is part of the reason that Constantine has to do this big crackdown is that contrary to the stories we're told, not everyone in the empire did consider his Christianity, his newfound Christianity, a relief. When Constantine comes to power, 90% of the empire is not Christian. So he has to turn an empire of 60 million people in what is a historical eye blink into believing something that they don't believe. And how do you do that? Well, you do it with laws and you do it with social persuasion. And you also, in the end, you do it with, with physical persuasion. And eventually, in the later centuries, you do it with terrible violence. Um, and the books, what happens is you start to see laws appear forbidding people from debating religion in public. And then... Eventually, what you start to see in places um, dotted across the empire is books burning in fires in front of churches, where books where Christians will hunt out from houses and then burn in pyres while a priest chants words, books that are considered dangerous. So that can be anything from um, heretical writings, they're the most commonly destroyed, to even things like philosophical writings later say those atomist philosophers who said don't worry you're all atoms they would they were targeted occasionally in these but yes but but also the comic poets and the love poets and and ovid and, and marshall and, and so on i mean and any mention of uh, sex is burned no not in fact no the sex isn't burned the, the, the real burning is heretical and things that they consider a magic which is a broad term and it can bleed into philosophy. The real thing, the thing that does for sex is that people just stop writing about it because they're hectoring, bishops tell them again and again that God, you know, God is watching everything you do and that sex, they are, they are understand, is, is in some ways wrong and not something to be celebrated, but it's a sort of stain on you. They tell all these stories of what happens to people who enjoy sex or have sex too freely or um, terrible stories about monks who get awful pustules when they get tempted and go to the flesh pots of the city and they return and they, they definitely reap a great deal of sorrow for their few moments of pleasure. But we do manage, uh, Catherine, I think you say that we, the Christians in 200 years managed to destroy 90% of classical literature. Yeah, so they, they destroy, they, um, they burn books in pyres and then 90% is lost. So 90% of all classical literature and 90%, 99% of all Latin literature is lost. And what survives, survives in one or two copies. And it, it's lost because, mainly not because of these burnings, this is what I explained in the, I can't remember which chapter it is, but it's lost because people start to despise it and they stop copying it, they stop reading it, they, they tell each other that they shouldn't read it, that it's wrong, it's wicked, it's demonic. And they, it just 
totally, it goes from libraries and, and libraries also suffer in this period because they're often in temples which are pulled down. Um, but the main loss is, is from neglect and lack of interest and also an incredibly hostile intellectual environment that says, you mustn't read these things, these are wicked. And poems such as Catullus, which was almost lost, we have it by the nearest chance that we still have Catullus and um, the work of Sappho, a Greek lesbian poet, uh, that she was the original lesbian, she was from Lesbos. Her work was, um, I think it was burned, it was definitely destroyed by Christians. So we have mere snatches of Sappho left. And the attack is also on statues and on art and on the library at Alexandria. Talk about the destruction of the library of Alexandria in 392 and the statue of Serapis and, and, and explain what the city was was like. So Alexandria was basically, it was the, call it what you like, it was kind of the Oxford or the Cambridge or the MIT, whatever whatever the analogy would be of the ancient world. It was where, if you were clever, you went there to study. And it was amazing. It had the biggest library in the ancient world. It would be thousands, uh, about 1,500 years before anything even came close to it. We think a lot about monks as being these studious men copying out manuscripts. It's, it's pretty much a nonsense. The most monastic libraries had about 20 books. Probably almost all of those 20 would have been religious books. The Library of Alexandria at its height had about 200,000 scrolls and it obsessively collected everything on every topic. Every religion, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, the first translation of the Jewish Bible was made here. And it, it was this astonishing wealth of knowledge and the cleverest minds in the world studied there. So Galen studied there, Eratosthenes studied there, um, Archimedes studied there. Now, by the by the time that the Christians gained power, it was a bit diminished. Various wars had kind of lost its collection, but there was still a big collection left and it was kept in this astonishing temple called the Temple of Serap- Serapis or Serapis. Now, nobody's heard of this today this temple of Serapis. Nobody nobody knows about it. We know about the Parthenon, we know about the Colosseum, we know about the Pantheon. Nobody knows about this. But the reason we don't know about it is not because it wasn't beautiful, because by all accounts, it was the most te- beautiful temple in the ancient world. When people write about which is the best temple, this is the one they pick. They say its statues are so lifelike, they look like they could draw a breath. It's stands on a hill above Alexandria, it's dazzling, it contains these beautiful statues, this great wealth, and in it, the remains of the Library of Alexandria, the remains of that 200,000 volume library. Now in 392 AD, you've, what you have is a Christian bishop who arrives in, in Alexandria and he says, it's not a beautiful temple, it's not a great library, what it is, is it's a dwelling house of demons, and we must tear it down. And so that's what happens. He gets a crowd of Christians. He goes up the steps, up the hill to this temple, and they tear it down. The most beautiful temple in the world is destroyed. And it's destroyed at the hands of Christians who think it's wicked, it's idols, it's demonic. And then the Library of Alexandria, what's left of it is the phrase they use is scattered to the winds. And the philosophers who had worked there and studied around there because temples were these sort of really lively places. Yes, and, and, and the, the statues were defaced, and, and the uh, yeah, beautiful and, well, statues were mutilated. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the statue of Serapis, the great one in the centre, is torn, torn apart, and then people rampage through the whole of Alexandria, mutilating more statues of Serapis. But they mutilate statues all over the ancient world. So the Parthenon, the, some statues on that were made by the greatest, um, in the, in the um, workshop of the greatest sculpture in the ancient world and they are defaced and they are they have their hands chopped off it's thought and it's pretty certain this is christian they have their hands chopped off their heads chopped off their feet chopped off and some of them are simply pushed off the parthenon and then ground into rubble so when you see the elgin marbles today most people think they're in a bad way because of elgin's workmen or because of the ravages of time no it was most certainly it was Christians deliberately smashing them because they thought they were demonic idols, and they did this everywhere. Yes, move f- forward. Still in Alexandria, they're also going to smash uh, human beings. And talk about Hypatia in 415 AD. Yeah, so a few years Also in Alexandria. Alexandria was a real hotbed of um, 
Christian activity, but also it was a hub, it was a intellectual hub. So the Christians were very threatened by it. And in 415 AD, um, there was the best mathematician in Alexandria, and by extension, quite probably the ancient world, was a woman called Hypatia. So she was very aristocratic, very beautiful from a long line of intellectuals and she used to teach widely in the city and she used to use uh, symbols to do her mathematics and she used astrolabes because she also did astronomy. In 415 AD, she was walking out of her house when some Christian men, led by a man who we're told was a perfect believer in Jesus Christ, saw her walking along and they said to they said and they'd been murmuring this some time. They said, she isn't a mathematician. She isn't an astronomer. Look at what she uses. Those things, those things she's writing, those objects she's using, they're not for maths or astronomy. They are symbols of the devil. And she is from hell and we have to kill her. So they take this woman, the most brilliant mathematician of her age, they drag her from her chariot and they flay her alive. And the accounts that, according to some of the accounts, they gouge out her eyes while she still gasps for breath. It is, to, and and then they burn, burn. Yeah, they take her body, the body to the edge edge of the city, and, and the accounts say that it's probably she burnt. They burn it in this thing that's a sort of rubbish heap at the edge of the city, and it's horrifying. This goes around the whole ancient world, and it sends the most powerful message to anyone who is not a Christian within a period of just over twenty years. You have demolished the most beautiful ancient temple and you have killed the most brilliant ancient mathematician. And that speaks volumes. And philosophy in Alexandria after that plummets because people are terrified. Continue with the story from 415 to the Emperor Justinian in in, uh, 527 becomes the, the... Roman Emperor, the Byzantine Emperor, and in Constantinople, and so another hundred years of hounding out, book burning, uh, destruction of temples, persecution of of uh, ancient philosophers and civilized human beings, and then we, and then and then we come to then we come to uh, Justinian, and, and talk briefly ab- about his. Uh, harsh laws, people that were not Christian were to be executed, and and then talk, and then move from there to the last of the uh, classical philosophers, Damascius. Great, yeah. Sure. So uh, bring the end of the your story so that way. After after Hypatia is killed, and after after that temple is destroyed. What you have is, is um, and in that period, actually, you have what you have been described as a legal juggernaut. So starting at the end of the time at the temple, when the Temple of Therapus is destroyed, law after law starts to be passed and against what they call the madness of the pagans. And so temples are chained shut, statues are smashed across the empire, and life, if you're not Christian, starts to become really pretty hard. And One of the things you get in this period, you get these amazing arguments from non-Christians saying, please, please, will you, like, let us be? Will you, you know, why can't we also do what we want? And there's this wonderful man called Symmachus who writes to the emperor and he says, we see the same stars, the same sky as shared by all. What does it matter what way we use to seek the truth? So what does it matter what God we worship? You know, we offer you prayers, not a battle. But the Christians, what they see themselves as fighting, like St. Anthony in the desert, battling those demons, they see that they are fighting a battle. There is good and there is evil. There is Christian, God, and there are all other gods. And their aim and their duty, if they're Christian, is to wipe out all these other religions. And that's how Justinian fits in. So Justinian is a kind of quite a strange man. He is a fervent Christian in a way that's hard for us to understand in the modern world, but he sees it as his job to close all the roads. This is the phrase that's used, to close the roads that lead to error. So he starts making these incredibly violent laws against homosexuality. So if you're homosexual, then in Justinian's law, you should be executed. And you get stories of bishops who are accused of having a relationship together. They're castrated and then paraded around town. 
um, in cages on the shoulders of people, people to other people to see what happens if you practice homosexuality. And he passes a law that says that if you encourage someone to commit adultery, if you're a nurse and you encourage your ward, so if you're a kind of nanny and you encourage your the woman you're in charge of to commit adultery, then you will have molten lead poured down your throat. Because Justinian said, you know, we have to close the, close the opening through which the suggestion of error came. And then the most famous law of Justinian is in 529 AD. What he decides to do is he decides to crack down on what he sees in some ways as a source of terrible ideas. And he says, we have to stop the teachers, the insanity of these pagan teachers who are teaching ways that are non-Christian. And he says, what his words are is that he says, we're going to, they, they shut the school at Athens. Now, this is one of the most famous schools in the ancient world. It's the Academy at Athens. And today, when we hear of something called an academy, it's called an academy because of this school. So they traced their own history back to Plato. Now, there were gaps, actually, but they saw themselves as being the inheritors of Plato who founded this academy. And then Justinian, in 529 AD, passes laws that are going to close it. And the reason that he does it is because he wants these philosophers to stop their teaching. So they're teaching things that that are in competition with Christianity and also could make Christians doubt their own beliefs. So he passes laws that say that if you, everyone in the empire now has to become a Christian. If you're not Christian, you have to get yourself to the church and convert. And if you don't get yourself to the church and convert, then you are going to be punished. And it doesn't end there. It says, if you don't get yourself to the church, if you go to the church and convert, and then you're found going back to your old gods, you will be executed. But the most famous one is he shuts this academy. And this academy that traces its history back a thousand years to the time of Plato. And that's when people come to write about this period later, they call it, Gibbon said that Christianity was more damaging to ancient philosophy than all of the barbarians. And this is the time, this is the date when people say, and from this moment on, the dark ages begin. Because from this moment on, philosophy is no longer free. That, 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 I mean, your book is, is to me, uh, deeply enlightening. I mean, why, the, you say that this, this story is is well known in academia, but it, it is not so well known, I don't think, in 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 our popular literature even today. It's interesting. The story of Christian, the Christian conversion of Europe, has been told almost entirely from pagan sources, uh, from not, from Christian sources. Sorry. So you never hear these. Even academic books will almost entirely tell it from the Christian point of view. These pagan sources, people like Seneca, saying, "What's going on? Why can't we all?" Be, live together um, they are just not used and partly it's because for most of the time that these have been studied they've been studied by Christians um, and until 1871 to teach in Oxford or Cambridge you practically had to be ordained so you practically had to be a member a, an active member of the Church of England you sort of had to be a priest and when stories were written against the Christians, such as Gibbon, they found themselves on an index of prohibited books. So the, the Vatican instantly placed Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was critical towards Christians, placed it on an index of forbidden books, banning it effectively from the regions over which the church had control. I have one final point, and the uh, Augustine's notions of... of cruelty and persecution and and his belief that ignorance is power i mean I, I i read augustine and i'm reminded of george orwell the the in 1984 war is peace freedom is slavery ignorance is strength mm -hmm. i mean that's pretty much augustine's pitch too no uh, Augustine is such a st strange and an interesting man and a, a, in some ways an extremely dislikable man because he says these things like, uh, or, you know, he celebrates ignorance in others at the same time as reading as much as he can himself, which is, I think, a common thing. Those who celebrate uh, ignorance for the masses rarely don't have enormous libraries themselves. And I mean, I think the most dangerous thing about Augustine, but you're right, he has this kind of double think where he will say things that seem paradoxical, but 
but also powerful. So he says these things like, we will cure them by cutting out their cancer. So he's amazing at twisting words to make it sound like, make cruelty sound like kindness. And it had a terrible influence. I mean, he's been credited with the following thousand years of Christian persecution of anyone who didn't agree with them. Catherine, I truly enjoy reading your book. I think it's it's uh, an important book. I hope many people read it. And thank you very much. We've been speaking today with Catherine Nixie about her new book, The Darkening Age, The Christian Destruction of the Classical World. Thank you very much. It was lovely to speak to you. Lapham's Quarterly brings voices from the past up to the microphone of the present. Save more than 30% off the cover price and subscribe today for only $49. Visit laphamsquarterly.org slash podcast for more details.